Hi, my name's Paul or Pav Popovich. Hello, my name's Kieran, Kieran Tyler. Uh, and I'd like to welcome you, or oh, the both of us would like, w- like to welcome you to Cave Escape, our new podcast. Um, I am a master's student at Leiden University in Holland, probably mispronouncing that. Um, I'm currently living in Oxford, however, so from the Oxford of Holland, I am now in Oxford proper, uh, and uh, I'm in the middle of a thesis on refugees in from Vietnam in, the 19, in 1979 coming to Britain. Um, uh, my origins are Serbian, uh, but I was born in Oxford as well, but live in London my whole life. Good stuff. Thanks, Paul. Um as I said, my name is Kieran. I'm currently an assistant lecturer and PhD student at the University of Kent. I'm doing my PhD in international relations, specifically state terrorism and even more specifically in false flag terrorism. Um, and Paul and I, I'm currently based in Hertfordshire at the moment, so I'm, I'm, I've decided to commuting now. And I just wanted to say that Paul and I both met, uh, we met each other at Royal Holloway College, uh, University of London, uh, based in Egham. And uh, as undergraduate students, and we did, we met, we, we we met and became friends in the first year, didn't we? I'm pretty <laughs> yeah. sure. I'm pretty sure. No, I, do remember, I do remember it. It was nice. It, I met you outside of uh, Reed. Oh uh, yes, yeah, yeah, of course. I think was because you met, you became friends with Anthony and Bax first, didn't you? Yeah, but I think at that point I came with that that girl Kiwi, and then we were just talking outside. Oh, okay, right, right, right. Uh, this was great. Uh, first year was brilliant. Um, it was a whole kind of going out to the SU until three in the morning, having got there at twelve, and then having pizza until six. Yeah, exactly. Oh, how times have changed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sort of for the better. I like to say. I'd like to say for the better. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, that SU was just a room. It was a dark room with a lot of sweaty bodies. So that, that was kind of our kind of imagination in terms of a night out. It's definitely got a lot better. Yeah, you're right. But I guess when you're 18 or 19 or whatever, and you have enough to drink, anywhere's anywhere's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, it really was. It's yeah. sort of like ignorance is bliss at that age, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the more you drink, the more ignorant you are. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Should we talk about why we're doing this darn podcast? Yes. Then? Let's get on okay. To it. So. Uh, <laughs> We, Off that kind of well, awkward start. Okay, no, yeah. It, it's, it's the first podcast, so it's going to get better on from here. So all those people who, that was... who, who have already, already left, they're already like, screw this, who are these people? This is <laughs> it was I the best promise movie. it will get better. Yeah. Um, so, well, I'm going to give my opinion. Paul can give his, but uh, obviously this is a joint effort. And um, a th- there is there is a bit of an ethos and a, a little bit of a philosophy behind the podcast, which we can talk about a bit later. But uh, I guess I wanted to do this podcast because I've been studying politics and history and philosophy now formally, uh, I guess since the age of, of 16, but I've been interested in all of those topics since the age of 15. And um, over the years, I guess I'd like to think I've acquired some uh, interesting and hopefully useful uh, opinions and analysis. And I've, I've done... Uh, a relative amount of research on certain specific topics right now and I'd like to share those and uh, another more sort of socially and um, socially and politically fired reason would be the fact that we live in a world uh, talking about the social world now which has as, as everyone knows serious amounts of problems with it um, and I would say from the ground up uh, there are huge amounts of problems, and I'm not saying that the problems start at the ground up. I mean, every every layer and level of society, there are issues which I believe need to be examined and re-examined and challenged in many cases. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, without without getting in uh, getting to too much of an ethical debate uh, straight away in the first introductory podcast. There's a hell of a lot of injustice in the world. And there's uh, an awful lot of misinformation and disinformation as well. And uh, it'd be nice to challenge and correct some of those issues as much as we can. And, you know, I'm not going to stand here and raise a fist and say sort of speak, speak truth to power. Um, but I but I think I think Paul and I both have um, a good level of comprehension and um, at the same time scepticism of some of the dominant uh, ideologies and um, social relations which are currently existing not just sort of in Britain or locally but you know 
we're a generation which we can go online and we can uh, examine and see uh, a lot of a lot of the key issues around the world and it's important to talk about those and uh, one other really main reason is I think it's going to be enjoyable it's going to be it's going to be fun for hopefully those out there who are going to listen and of course for Paul and myself and anyone else uh, whom we can get on the podcast and interview about their interests research opinions uh, and anything else so I'm gonna I'm gonna shut up there and I'm gonna let uh, Paul Spill speak about his reasons now. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. Uh, it's also you know I really do want to emphasize it's really key that we do have fun. Um, this is not going to be immensely structured, even though I probably like to structure things. Regardless, uh, it's going to be trying to meet new people and just just kind of different perspectives on any subject. Uh, you know, all the way from sport to film to politics to. Uh, cookery, uh, Russian cuisine. Me and Kieran were just talking about. <laughs> uh, so you know, it, it, the the idea is varied and that it's open. You know, open mindedness, uh, and I think that's the key to anything. Is just kind of accepting that there's different viewpoints uh, and just different different lifestyles as well, and just 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 learning from other people. Um, personally, uh, actually, I think it's probably quite key to just um, just to tell you why it's called Cave Escape. Um, that goes back to Plato. Um, who I read in university. Did you read him in university as well, Kieran? Or? Yeah, The Republic, his Republic. Well, I, I claimed I read him in, in university for <laughs> classical political um, theory. <laughs> First year of university, which I did rather poorly on. I, yeah. I, I definitely read some Plato. <laughs> Brilliant. It just have to be a little bit. I mean, I didn't. I never actually read Republic, funny enough, but I've, I've done modules in Plato and uh, and, and uh, dissertation. He, he is my guy. He was. He really kind of opened up truth to me and I, and just perspective um and obviously this 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 uh this blog cave escape that the name comes from the idea of the prisoner escaping the cave and seeing greater reality everyone knows the energy the parable uh, if you don't look it up it's brilliant uh, and that kind of idea of kind of being exposed to a whole new truth and realizing that where you come from or what you knew wasn't truth is kind of what drives me i think it's what drives kieran um, and it's what I think would drive this blog. Uh, you know, I, I think Kieran's heard this story many times, and I've got an interview for a course on Friday where I'll repeat the story. Um, but like one of the most kind of, you know, minor at the time kind of events, but major in my life events was when I was, I don't know, in year eight or whatever, 13 years old in school, younger, 12, 11. Uh, and I was sitting next to a um, Muslim kind of. Uh, friend i'm sure it was my friend at the time but he was he was a classmate and uh, it was a time of the war or or you know it was after the war in yugoslavia serbia where i'm from well which is what serbia was part of uh where i'm from and i remember the teacher turning around and telling telling the whole class how what the serbs did so where i'm from what the serbs did was so you know disgusting and the way they treated muslims was so abhorrent um, and that we were, you know, awful, awful people. And this is when she found out I was Serbian, I think. And, you know, it was quite a spiel in front of everybody else. And I was, you know, I was young. I was pretty, pretty tender, pretty, and I was not very confident back then. I was going through some tough times. And, it, you know, it was one of the most shocking kind of events I had to be, just to be told that I'm almost, I was made to feel kind of worthless for being associated with a country, you know, you know, in, in events that I never, I was never part of. Um, you know, I was, you know, proud to be Serbian. I think you should be proud of where you're from. Although, whether I believe in nationalism, whatever, I'm not sure anymore. But that, back then, I did. And I remember from then that that was a desire to kind of, you know, I came out of the class and I turned to my dad and asked him about it. You know, because this is the first time I heard about it. And he, you know, his reply was something like, "Well, the, the British invented racism or slavery or something." It was a very kind of angry reply. Um, but it, you know, I, I kind of didn't want to believe it. I didn't want to believe that I was associated with these awful things, and I just didn't want to. I wanted to be proved wrong, so I just started researching and reading and Wikipedia. So when Wikipedia came out, when it was time, maybe a bit later, um, and that led to other interests and so on. I just started looking into um, every little f- detail I could um, after that for the war and, and on grand scale to kind of you know cleanse my soul almost. And I did, it was kind of like a roller coaster. I, you know, I learned so much from that. And from after uni, you know, it, it just increased and increased. So it's, it's that same kind of, I don't know if I was in a bit of a tangent there, but it's the same kind of idea now that I kind of just want to learn the truth, you know? I want to learn if things really are that bad, really are that good, or if it tastes that good, it tastes that bad, or, you know. Uh, I don't really believe in polarizing debates. I believe in kind of hearing all sides. Um, and I think that event kind of sprung that up. Um, 
But yeah, I don't know if you share the same kind of sentiments, Kieran, in terms of truth. Yeah, I um, I would agree, and uh, but I would add something to that. I would say that, uh, well, firstly, I would say that Cave Estate, we're not being so pretentious here to suggest that listening to this podcast is going to sort of um, allow you to transcend all ignorance <laughs> because Paul and I are so uh, extraordinarily wise. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's just, we, just thought it, we just thought it was a witty name and it had uh, some interesting meanings behind it. Um, and I, I would add that regarding Plato's cave allegory, I think a more sort of um, modern or actually postmodern uh Mm-hmm. explanation of that or not, or not quite explanation but um, a postmodern theory that you can attach to that with regards to knowledge and, and the way that uh, social knowledge is, is constructed socially is that there are multiple caves with, in multiple contexts with multiple truths out there and uh, Paul and I and every, every single person we bring to we bring to our analysis unintentional biases just from the culture we're in the way we're brought up and i think it's important that we reflect upon that and be reflexive so that is sort of uh take account of the effects that our own personalities or sort of the pre- our, our research on what's being investigated how that can affect it and, and bias sometimes uh, our ideas and you can see it so often i think in in much of the mainstream whether it's regards just to the media or dominant ideologies uh, of this unquestioned, uh, almost commonsensical notion that you know that you shouldn't question. Oh, it's common sense, but it's actually it's just as as one particular social context uh, that we're favouring for whatever reason. And uh, I think it's important to, as as I just previously said, reflect on that and and accept the possibility that 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 rather than just sort of one universal truth, uh, that it's very difficult to to. to uh, accept that as as always as, as valid when when we're coming at issues from a social context because depending on which lens you're vu- viewing the world from you know putting yourself say trying to, trying to put yourself in the shoes of a prime minister or president of a nation and viewing the world rather than say uh, viewing it from um, some of the most impoverished people on earth in same parts of of areas of the Congo, like the, the pygmy tribes who are, are systematically sort of repressed and persecuted by all them around them and have got virtually next to nothing and are t- treated as unhuman still, uh, they're going to view the world very, very differently and, and their idea of what truth is and what knowledge is is, is going to be different. So we have, I think we have to take account of that and tr- definitely try and... Uh, over, try and overcome or at the very least reflect that these biases exist and that um, it, this isn't this and and also that it's a constantly changing world that we live in especially socially and we're not just talking about the you know the changes in technology but just i think the very everything from social relations to your own personal relations in life every, everything's transient everything's constantly in flux and so uh, we i think we have to recognize that and that the the idea that truth is static. Um, uh, what do you mean? By how 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 is truth static and, and everything else is in, in flux? What no, 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 no. I, I was just going to say the idea that that truth is static uh-huh. is questionable um, because everything is changing and um, not new. Just 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 say if we look at the natural sciences as well as social sciences, new theories come about and um, new evidence comes to uh, you know comes to fruition and and I think we should try and adapt to that and rather than you know we have to accept the fact that we do living is is changing world and it's very difficult to discern and uh, one other caveat i will add to that is that the world is infinitely complex and um to try and understand it in any meaningful way is is always going to be inherently uh difficult and maybe some would argue impossible but uh even if it is uh, maybe in truly impossible i don't think it's something which should be uh, abandoned and the, the, we can bear useful fruit from that <laughs> from that endeavor so to speak even if you, we can never fully grasp uh, the one single truth of of something i mean you only have to look at certain historical events and uh, the debates that go on around them to realize how difficult it is um History is continuously, continuously reinterpreted. Right, exactly. Uh, That's what I mean. That's exactly what I mean. When it, when, so when it comes to uh, 
uh, us, our opinions and research and 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 they said sort of the form of that 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 legitimate form of revisionism which which takes place just in history alone um, not even mentioning any other social sciences or, or, or disciplines uh, so obviously Paul and I are happy to throw our two pennies in but I'm always skeptical of those who claim they know they know the truth and they know the answer uh, yeah you know, we're all skeptical skeptical of ourselves almost well, no, yeah. but it's true you know even you know going back to plato for enough you know he his obviously his kind of dilemma his paradox was that he said you know if he, the person who knows he knows nothing knows everything um uh but on top of that he felt that because he because he knew that he knew nothing and that he knew more than others <laughs> right, he, right. so he that was a kind of the, the kind of arrogance he had in believing his philosophy was right um actually meant that he yeah, that, that he he was kind of negating what he believed in, um, and he he himself, Plato, eventually, you know, for for how much he thought he knew the world, and he thought there was a dualist world that you know that we had two realms and that we kind of relied on the theory of forms. He he still needed to use the physical world to connect to that world to to explain how we are here. If you know what I'm saying, so the theory of the forms that was that wasn't physical. It was a kind of another realm that we got our essence from. Uh, and he believed that it was a true world and phys- everything physical wasn't real. But actually to explain how we knew of the world, he, he essentially had to label it on a little kind of part of the brain that he said was a kind of portal to the other world. So he still had to use a physical part of the world to connect the two, if you see what I'm saying. Right. Um, so no matter what he tried, no matter how much he tried to be dualist and non-physical, he still couldn't escape the physical world. Um, so, uh, you know, for somebody who's so certain, he still seemed to get it wrong. <laughs> Um, right yeah yes i mean um i i would agree yeah that it's important to to remember that and one other thing i'd, I'd like to just quickly go back on talking about uh, s- social knowledge and how it's sort of socially created uh and this is sort of a more of a it's a postmodern idea i guess you can call it but it's it's, it's the idea that when, when we say a thing is a, a fact we say it's sort of is it a a fact from from what angle because unlike uh, some of the or most of the natural sciences where you can use say an, or, or a mathematics where you can use a form of very pure and rigorous logic to discern things uh, when we talk about events in the social world uh, we have to realize that that content uh, context and interpretation are, are actually really quite important and something that we, we take for granted and uh, you know current affairs uh, uh, especially um, with its sort of sound bites and its memes these days uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. the impact of social media we really have to bring in the fact about sort of uh, what's Great really fun. going on from, from, from whose perspective are we saying that this is what's happened and this is what is happening and um, at a more yeah. pra- and just at a more practical level about whether we do all have uh, have the facts the relevant enough facts to to actually make a a relevant and valid opinion on 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 certain events you know definitely well you know you always see the news they have a kind of limit of, of memory to about ten years or so on or even less than that usually if, yeah, if they're talking yeah. about a war for instance or any kind of event it's it's usually they talk about what's happened in the last year or a couple of months they don't talk about you know, how far history really goes sometimes and how much an effect that has. It's not possible and you can't blame them. Um, but at the same time, in some ways it might be necessary, you know. Um, uh, I don't want to harp on, harp on about, you know, Yugoslavia, but like mm. the problems there don't come from the last 10 years, 20 years. It, it comes from, you know, possibly the Ottoman Empire, some people argue. Um, so, but people, you know, people argue that, but, but then they're usually outside of kind of mainstream view or not mainstream view, but they're outside of kind of popular demand really um and we're just kind of fed the bites and we're told that's a truth and it, it is to extent but it's not the whole truth um so it's just interesting like you like you say that context makes a difference if you looked at um the atomic bomb for instance people mm. see that as a massively strategic victory i guess you know it stopped the war from evolving it was after Pearl harbor but actually you know it was also in my opinion now massive atrocity you killed a lot of innocent people um it's a sort of retribution almost in my opinion so but that, that's me it's coming from somebody who's not necessarily pro-war or pacifist in that sense so i will see it as that that way um and i think you're right that's the kind of how perspective works you know even in time things will change 
Um, right, yeah. exactly. And uh, I think on top of that, I mean, I would agree wholeheartedly, and you know, especially with relation to the dropping of the atomic bombs. I mean, uh, certain events like that, but but uh, although they divide people, it's usually sort of hardcore American or or, or even Western nationalists. Even though it seems a bit of an oxymoron to say a Western national nationalist, <laughs> but but um, who, who are going to defend until their death the fact that these uh, atrocities. Uh, took place, which of course, if you were um, a relative or just one of those one of those people caught up in it, you, you know, <laughs> yeah. in Nagasaki or Hiroshima, you, you're going to have a slightly different uh, perspective, I think, on on what went ha- on what happened there that day. Yeah, yeah. And we ha- and I think relating to that is the fact that because that type of knowledge and uh, it's sort of socially created and, and has so many biases and contexts within it. I don't know whether you'd agree with this, Paul, but I think we have to take sides. You have to sort of, although I don't want to, you know, I'm not coming off as a as a as an anarchist or a Marxist, where it's sort of, well, you're either on the working class's side or you're on the bourgeoisie side, and and you know, the bourgeoisie are oppressing the working class or the proletariat, so you've got to be on the proletariat side to be on the morally right side of, of yeah. history. But but yeah. I think on a more nuanced level, on a day to day level, we have to think about. Sort of, the individual people in those situations and and who's being impacted and 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 in that sense of who's who are you sticking up for who are we going to who would you support with with you know the arguments and analysis um that we're going to be talking about and discussing and i think it's very difficult to get away from that and pretending to be neutral um is always going to be problematic and i think even an idea of neutrality you can argue it's a form of, of taking sides and it never really is because usually it's it's sort of supporting some sort of status quo so i don't know whether you'd agree with me with that that's probably maybe one of the more controversial things i'm gonna uh, <laughs> i'm gonna say on this first introductory podcast but uh, it, it is difficult i kind of i, I just kind of switch in between you know that there's sometimes i feel like i know i know exactly what's happened and i can take this side and there are times where I turn around and like, well, you know, I'm not so, so sure anymore. I, I, I it, you know, it depends again on context. You know, keep talking about this, you know. It, but I think when it comes to it, yeah, you, you do need to, you do need to take some sides. You need to have some certainty. You, uh, you need to, you know, really decide um, what the common ground is, and then kind of use that common, you know, what, what your kind of basic right, right. idea is. So you know, like you're saying, who who's benefiting from it. Or, or innocent people getting hurt, kind of thing. If that's the kind of philosophy you use, you apply that from 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 day to day. You know, uh, that's how I see it. Um, it's just so immensely difficult. You know, like even with, you know, people give politicians a lot, a lot of problems, but politicians are unfortunately human beings like us, and they make mistakes that we would make in that situation. Um, uh, and it's hard to be critical, but then if you're not critical, things don't improve. You know, um, yeah. if Gandhi, you know, if Gandhi or Martin Luther King, uh, it's kind of like the anti-Nazi um, argument. You know, there's always an arguments they say, all arguments end up mentioning Nazis. Uh, oh, if you argue, yeah, there's a there's a there's a, a law. I can't remember what the laws yeah. are named after it. Actually, yeah. somebody somebody out there who does listen to this, we're going to scream it out. It's like you idiots, you can't remember the name of this law. I think <laughs> yeah. the, I think it's, the theory is or the law is rather that. Um, isn't After awesome. a certain amount of argu- a certain amount of time, an argument continues for on the internet. It eventually de- de- devolves into one accusing the other of supporting or being a Nazi. Isn't it something like that? Some of that, yeah. You know, <laughs> my counter is that after a while, I'll use this argument, which is kind of like the you know Gandhi, Martin Luther King, King one, where it's just like if you don't take sides, if you sit on the fence, you're essentially you know letting things happen that could be stopped. You know, I don't think Martin Luther King turned around and was like. Well, you know, politicians are pretty hard. So the whole thing they do with black people, I mean, I can't understand it. I think he turned around and took a side. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> and fought yeah. for people's rights. Same yeah. again, you know. Um, and that, and that, that's what you have to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you don't, maybe you can leave it until specifics, but I would say on a broader issue, I I'd, again, from, this is my, my own personal opinion. And by the way, I will say as a caveat, because I said this sort of, as Paul and I were discussing a bit before we, we started this uh, recording, uh, as a caveat, uh, as I am employed by the University of Kent, all of these 
views and opinions of mine are my own and do not reflect the university at all. Um, so please, nobody try to sue me or get me fired for anything that I may <laughs> may or may not mention uh, in this in this podcast. Yeah, I have, I have um, it myself. I'm not sure if I, I'm, I'm a student, so I'm assuming I can't get fired. <laughs> I think so. I, th- I think you're okay. I think you should be okay. okay cool. I should. I won't do a disclaimer just to kind of <laughs> seem cool or something. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so sorry, I always thought so. But what I was going to say is that with regards to taking sites, uh, just on a broader level, I think s- trying to understand and um, perceive the world from those who are who, t- who are either voiceless or powerless or, or, or themselves being oppressed or seem to be, at least from the outside, being oppressed and, and so on, trying to empathise and step into their shoes and... and, and and in, I think in that sense, f- for me personally anyway, you can take sides uh, a lot more safely. So, and, and n- f- again... If you, if, you, if, you, if you empower the voices, you take, it's easy to take, take sides. Is that, is that what you're right. saying? Well, but recognise, okay, recognising at a fundamental level, I mean, we said this, uh, well, I'd said this for, for one of the reasons for doing the podcast, recognising at a fundamental level that the world isn't, isn't fair. The social world. Not, we're not just talking about yeah. nature and the fact that there's earthquakes and there's nothing we can do about them and it's unfair and we can blame the universe or, or God or whomever. But I mean, the social world that us humans have created and helped to create on a daily basis by, by just um, agreeing with or going along with the status quo, uh, which is, like I said, a form of stating, uh, uh, taking sides, that it, it's... It's inherently unjust in many ways and unfair, and we have to recognise that and realise that there are people, uh, whether they're groups of people, whole nations, uh, that are either um, exploited or being oppressed or, in, in many cases, being actually massacred. And we have to, you have to take sides and, 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 and voice an opinion about these. That's what I wanted to say. So you kind of Aristotle's opinion that there will always be a master and slave relationship. Um, well, no, 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 just I'm not even saying that there always will yeah. be. I'm saying that we live there in a is. world in which there is one, and we have to recognise that. And I think mm. it's, I think it's almost, almost well, not not undebatable, but it's o- obvious almost to anyone. Because even if you support some sort of status quo, where except that the West or, or or America is the the leader of the world, but that's that's for the global good of the world you know, in, from an international relations perspective. Or if we, we talk about that, well, we have states and we have nationalism and we have capitalism, we have all these different ideologies, and it's it's because they're the, they're for the greater good of society, and these are the best you know the, the best ideologies we can come up with. We have to recognise that the world is has has been and is <clears throat> socially created. Uh, so it's it's been made by humans, and that within the world that that us humans have created, unfortunately, there are those who have and those who who have not. And I'm just not just just talking about economics here in a sort of any sort yeah. of Marxian or anarchist sense, yeah, for, yeah. but from every type of position and sort of asking ourselves why is that and why is it w- sort of why is there so much injustice and who should we be standing up for uh, yeah, in that yeah. sense? And our, my argument is well, we should be standing up for those who are who 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 are being a, a, oppressed in in any sense of the word yeah 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 i'm not um, sure if you'd agree with that or not <laughs> no, no i think i think it's interesting I, I, um my, my only problem is in, in trying to find fairness i think i do i do find myself kind of being trying to be fair to everybody um so you know we're talking about everybody's you know people being oppressed obviously the people are there are people that are massively oppressed but i think everybody faces some sort of oppression individually you know um so like yeah. i was saying earlier no matter how much you might dislike say david cameron i don't know he has an impression because he's at the will of the people and so he has to live by a certain code his whole life you know through 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 night and day now i don't sympathize with the guy he picked the job and uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily his biggest fan <laughs> but it, it does you know sometimes he might make a decision that's wrong uh, and then in, in kind of search for fairness, I'll try to, you know, kind of explain how human it is to make a decision. Um, but then that makes things like taking sides more difficult. Okay, uh, I understand where you're coming from. I guess if I try and use a real world example, yeah. and uh, I guess it's again a more of an extreme and easy case to, to put forward where, where a few people would uh, disagree with, but, but it can highlight a, in a broader sense of what, what I personally think mm-hmm. uh, at least part of the podcast should be about. Um, a group of people in um, 
Central Africa or the uh, the, the Congo, um, the, the pygmies who are, are seen as unhuman by essentially all their neighbours and and they're, they're enslaved and they're they're and in that sense they're directly exploited and often to the times to the point of death and there's so much prejudice against them. So in that, if you look at that case uh, ex- f- f- um, from the outside. Uh, you don't even have to be sort of an, an ethnographist or, or, or an anthropologist and step into the tribe to really find out whether there is such uh, oppression and exploitation. But just looking at that situation, I can sit there, analyse it and go, I know whose side I'm taking. And it's not yes. going to be those Congolese who think it's OK to enslave the pygmies and cut them up and eat them because they think they're magical or, or some nonsense such as that. So that's yeah. what I'm trying to say, that we can look at the world and it is possible to discern social facts uh, and, and, and a certain, there's a certain uh, um, truth in the idea that, uh, or the proposition that there is injustice and we must, I would argue that we must take sides in, in a situation like that. I know it's easy to take sides when we're talking about a small minority of people who are being oppressed and the world's a lot yeah, yeah. grey than black and white. Yeah, but, pretty harsh there, but yeah exactly. Yeah. However, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it, it shows a well for me anyway it's a broader position that that i think i i would like to bring into this this podcast at least yeah 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 i definitely i definitely think so as well i mean um yeah being honest i I do struggle in terms of my my usual reaction is to take sides and say the way you do uh it's it will pretty always will be um and trying to fair and balanced like like i said i can kind of waver about but i i i completely agree and 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 that's kind of i try to practice that that i try to help the people personally how i can who i think don't have things uh like they should um uh, who have it difficult and who who need extra support in life i think sometimes society uh doesn't realize how different and varied it is and and it's kind of homogeneity and the kind of attempt to create the ideal average man you know i do love it doesn't make sense but there's there's always an average man or woman that society envisages and it kind of forgets about all the other people um who actually make make up society um such as people with disabilities or whatever if this you know, ethnicities or you know and there's yeah, various, yeah. various stereotypes but because society so tries to be so homogenous it doesn't realize its variety uh, and i like to promote that variety and i like people to not necessarily um overpower other people but just to have their voice heard as well and and, and, and you know I've, I've, I, I like to work with those kind of people so I've worked with people with disabilities I've worked with, with asylum seekers and refugees um, and to be honest because I'm so bored of what society thinks is normal I love meeting people who are on the margins who are put on the margins of society because you meet such great characters uh, and, and stories and you hear you kind of reflect on your own self um and that's where I'm really interested, that kind of difference, that uniqueness and that kind of outside the norm. Um, so as a consequence, I would probably pretty much always agree with you. <laughs> but I'd like to see those people in that position and hear about them and, and support them. Um, uh, and, and I would pretty much always take their side, um, especially, I think, when you have interactions with people who are like that, you're much more likely to sympathize with them. So, you know, I, I think it just kind of opens you up to how human they are and how similar they are, but how how, how great they are. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just rambling. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's all good stuff. Now, I would uh, I would agree. I'd agree pretty much wholeheartedly. And I want to um, step in and, and add to your point about what you said uh, from your, you know, in your, in your view, you're you're sick of being sort of told what, what is normal. Or you're, or you're essentially sick of the normal. Yeah. And I think it's important to and i'd like to definitely like to a few of the podcasts in the future at uh, some time getting get into and analyze the assumptions of what is normal and yeah. why we live uh life the way we do and the why uh the world is structured the way it is because there are so many assumptions built in which we don't even think about just a completely unconscious level that and then if someone questions them we have a knee-jerk uh, emo- yeah, often yeah. emotional reaction to oh don't be so uh, silly you you know of, of course the world or of course uh, <laughs> our society is like that how could it possibly be any other way and I think so we need to step that, back yeah. and say uh, well actually the way it is right now is pretty appalling and uh, you know we can think of better ways to uh, to either um, order society or um, or if, if you're you know more <laughs> more leaning towards all of that anarchy or, or some some variant of it to unorder society because the order is so unfair and unjust so uh, getting into the assumptions and how 
how these assumptions have built up and, and this sort of notion of, of common sense. I think challenging that and really thinking about it is actually quite key to unpicking and understanding uh, the rest of the world globally. Definitely. I, I, and recently I kind, of, I kind of came to my head, I would love to find out historically where that, that stereotype comes from, you know, with such a, you know, there, there must have been variety, you know, back in whatever time civilization started. Um, but for someone to come out and say, like, the norm is, you know, or let's let's say classically a white male in the Western world, you know, and that, right, and that right. kind of, you know, women or whatever, and uh, foreigners are this and that, and that kind of evolved. It'd be great to see how that kind of, you know, I guess sociologists and anthropologists know this, but that how that kind of, Fear of the outsider was created, um, and you know. No, oh, exactly. And I mean, well, one part of that, without sorry for interrupting you, Paul. Mm-hmm. One part of that, without going too deeply into it, is sort of nationalism. For example, yeah. I know you briefly uh, mentioned yes. it uh, at the start, and um, obviously it's very divisive. But but where did that come from, and why do we think this is a, a, an acceptable a virtue? Why do you think it's a value? Like sort of, why do we think nationalism? Is good because what, one thing we can say about the whole world is it's one of the dominant ideologies underpinning it. There are there are over two, I believe, last last time I counted, there are over two hundred nations, really counts. nation states in the world, uh, according to the United Nations, or maybe just under, perhaps depending on how you uh, how, how you define what a nation state is. Um, and it's clearly one of the dominant ideologies, along with, say, uh, or belief systems, along with, say, capitalism is obviously from an economic and uh, many, many really? social sciences. Uh, you know, well, yeah, would argue from a, um, a political perspective as well. So, you know, capitalism, nationalism, statism, they're, they're really dominant, almost almost unquestionable in the mainstream uh, uh, ideologies, which which if you challenge them or in, in any meaningful way, you're going to be shut, shut down, essentially. I couldn't imagine many talking points on something such as, as the BBC or even more left-wing... Um, um, even more left-wing yeah. institutions, such such as perhaps even even though it's a um, a paper which has a great amount of journalism and investigative journalism, especially the Guardian, I couldn't really imagine them qu- questioning to to such an extent uh, the whole system itself, like such as part of it, the i.e. sort of statism mm-hmm. and, and even nationalism on top of that. You know, there are quite a lot of left-wing pundits about talk about what this nation needs to do to 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 help the to help the poor in society and think, well, yeah. what about the poor in the rest of the world? <laughs> yeah, you, you, you understand, I guess, I mean, you do understand, it's like the Guardian is an, a national paper. <laughs> I guess as soon as they start talking about nation state, no matter how much they're ideologically, you know, quite mm. consistent, well, slightly consistent, uh, it's like saying, well, I guess we'll just kind of destroy all of our customers. Uh, but, but yeah, you're right. It is It is interesting how that is, that is so... Uh, still not very well sorry how much that's not that debated yet you know much debate is about religion and how religion affects the world and and so on and so forth but like you say yourself nationalism is a kind of form of opium for the masses uh you know i, I really you know i love coming from serbia i love my people in serbia my family and so on and I've, a lot of times i felt serbian but the older i've got the more i've kind of distanced myself from it i just kind of and anything like the sort, I kind of don't understand it anymore. You know, I've been told. You know, I think the problem with nationalism, in my in my opinion, um, is that it kind of creates an outsider. Right. Uh, yes. Yes. And as a consequence, you kind of told to not like the outsider, not trust the outsider. And I think that by itself is a flaw. Um, I'd even rather you have a kind of global world, which is probably too much, uh, uh, where everybody's you know doesn't matter where you are, or you have a regional kind of much more local world where you know. Uh, there's no, you know, maybe, well, it's still an outsider, but you're not kind of ethnically divided. Um, but it, it's, it's true. It's just such a kind of taken concept. But it's just silly. Uh, you know, these borders are, you know, mostly just made up, you know, there's maybe a mountain here or a lake there, and that's the border. That's where it starts. But it doesn't really mean anything, you know. If, if you're born a mile from the mm. Welsh border in Wales, yeah, yeah. suddenly because you're two miles away from the English people, you're, you're supposed to be much different. I don't, I don't really understand right, that. Yeah, and uh, I mean, and also another issue is it, it degrades ethics so much, and on a very practical, in a very practical way, in my opinion. I mean, if you look at uh, examples from all uh, parts of, of of the media, let's. I mean, I don't want to. I don't. I don't think we should get too deeply into, no. into the refugee crisis. Maybe we could um, save that for for next week or a week after. Yeah. Um, uh, but. 
there's often talk about these people, they're Syrians, they're Libyans, they're <coughs> Af uh, Afghanistanis, uh, uh, um, you know, they're, they're always people, they're the people of a nation. They're not just people. Yeah. They're not, oh, they're humans who, they're desperate and they want to get food and drink. It's like, who are they? Oh, it doesn't matter. They're people, they're humans, just like you yeah, and I. Yeah. They breathe, they, uh, they're they conscious, sentient beings, they feel pain. Uh, should we help? It's like, but, but where are they from? Where, where, where are they from? Does it yeah. matter? <laughs> no, that's one of the biggest, biggest kind of arguments for open borders, which I'm not sure I believe in necessarily. I think maybe regulation has to happen. I, I haven't really thought about it enough. Um, but uh, one of the arguments for open borders is kind of like you, you kind of, your life is mostly decided about where you're born, um, not by what you do. You know, you're born in Syria. No matter what you do, no matter what you do before the war, is ref, you know, before, before you become a refugee, before, you know, you might be educated, you might be whatever. Um, by the time you reach anyways a refugee statistically you know you're much more likely to basically have to take several steps down a ladder and do jobs that are nowhere near your, your kind of level so the fact that you're born in Syria has already kind of massively given you a kind of disadvantage in life which is crazy you know that's why people say borders should be open so that no matter where you're born you have the possibility to move around um I, I you know i'd go probably steps behind that and just say actually don't sell arms to <laughs> assad <laughs> um in the first place but yeah it, it, it's interesting you're right it, that, that that kind of concept of they're not human beings they're, they're a different ethnicity right exactly yeah i mean i wasn't trying to get into the nitty gritty details of the politics and the, and the policy yeah. there but really just reflect yeah, sorry, on I did <laughs> no no it's no it's fine i mean feel feel free but really just reflect on how problematic it is to yeah. to treat nationalism as a foundation for for defining people so and obviously i again i, I used the example of in, in you know of the, the current refugee crisis which has been going on for years of course and it's again that's another issue you can get into why the media fixate fixates on certain crises at certain times and how that comes to be because it's something which has been ongoing for at least uh three or four years uh, as far as i'm aware and uh i think a lot of the numbers obviously you know are trending upwards and have they perhaps spiked uh, 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 to a certain degree, but I'm sure this isn't saying which, you know, it's like, oh, by the way, a few months ago, you know, a few hundred thousand people from, from Syria decided to, to pour into the rest of the world, <laughs> but, you know, on one mass movement. It's, it's nonsense. I mean, uh, so, um, but, but, but yeah, I, I just wanted to highlight one key issue yeah, such yeah. as that and, and how problematic it can be to treat people with all of these other labels um, which are sort of reifying. They're not. They're not concrete material things. I'm a. You know. I mean. Uh, uh, I'm. I'm British. What, what does that mean to me? Well, to me personally, it, it doesn't mean much at all. <laughs> yeah, but yet, you know, this is another thing because I studied migration. I didn't mention this earlier. But this is another thing that's quite interesting: is that when a migrant, sorry to get more involved, I just find it quite interesting. When when a migrant comes to another country, they talk about integration. So they talk about it has a migrant integrated into the local culture. But but the, you know, if you come to Britain, there's white British, you know, ethnically British people who have don't feel part of a mainstream white culture or whatever. Not white culture, but mainstream British culture. You know. And yet we, we expect people from outside to have to come and subject themselves to this kind of mainstream culture as well. Like, I, you know, I, okay, I'm not, I'm Serbian, but I do feel quite British in whatever sense that nationalism works. But I, I don't feel like I have to, you know, subject myself to what's common here. You know, I don't, I don't feel like I have a certain, certain culture I understand um, or feel part of. Uh, I don't think there is such a thing. People who, who tell me that they're British all seem to like different things. <laughs> um uh, are we supposed to all like something in common? Um, I'm not sure. My, my only problem with this is, is that I, I do also think that, um, unfortunately, prejudice can also be quite a, a normal reaction, unfortunately, in the sense that I think that we live our lives by prejudging everything, by basing it on what we know. So it's very unlikely that we'll kind of uh, see something new and not try to understand it through what we've learned. Um, and this, is, this is one of the main problems, is that uh, I actually think that I'm, massively prejudice a lot of time it's just that i don't don't actually let that prejudice actually um take effect if you know what i'm saying so um i think there'll always be kind of borders within our knowledge and therefore borders and uh limits to um how we react to the rest of the uh, to out, outside knowledge if you see what i'm saying so even if there's a national border so it is, there's, that, that means that we don't know about these outsiders and we kind of stereotype them even if it went away we still have borders to what we know so uh, if I met somebody, you know, if I met something 
that I've never heard of, an alien, I suddenly stereotype them by what I do know. Um, right. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I see exactly what you're saying. And, you know, I, I would agree. And I think it's a, a topic we can get into more more detail about, yes. about sort of the otherness and uh, just the mere, the mere fact that... Um, I mean, sometimes at an almost fundamental level, when it, when it comes to sort of identity, the mere fact of, of being one way and choosing to be that specific way, the fact that there are others out there yeah. uh, to some people, and they can interpret that as a threat because they're acting in an alternative way, which isn't like them. Yeah. And that's, that's the worry. Like, why aren't they living like I'm living? Why aren't they doing what I'm doing? Yeah. Uh, and and some people interpret that as as a threat to their way of life because they think, well, maybe they'll come over here and try and make me act the way uh, they're acting and I don't want to do that, et cetera, et cetera. And it can- I think that's the basis of any kind of hate or kind of that, that fear. I really think that. I think that, um, and I understand it in a way, you know? I think, like I say, I think probably I, I have that fear as well that this kind of, let's say, it's a mainstream British society where, you know, I don't know, whatever kind of machoism whatever is kind of the, the 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 norm and i used to believe in that i used to think that being macho or whatever was kind of how you're supposed to live your life and i realized actually i've been told to think that way by people around me it's actually quite harmful but 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 you know like the, if some if suddenly if i was in a country where there wasn't macho, machoism and somebody came there who was macho i'd be like oh, oh, oh i don't want to be anything like you <laughs> right, right you know but, but you can coexist you know i don't know I think it's, it's interesting stuff. Oh, it's good. Okay, I I think that maybe we should start start wrapping this this up for now because <laughs> yeah. it's gone on for quite a while and we've got yeah, a lot of sure content. Had, uh, and uh, well, oh, the only thing perhaps we missed was was telling the the, the one individual person out there who may be listening uh, <laughs> of yeah. what the format uh, will be on the hopefully. I mean, dare we say weekly basis if possible? Yes, weekly or fortnightly, but definitely. Okay, yeah. okay, we'll aim for weekly, uh, if yes. not fortnightly basis yes. uh, for the podcast. Uh, so Paul and I thought of the idea of, of that we'd both bring one topic or uh, news article or item to discussion and uh, we would talk about it briefly beforehand and do a little bit of research and we could ask each other questions about it, uh, about the topic and really um, get into, hopefully get into some uh, some depth about it. And well, obviously we don't want to say how long we'd spend on each each one but if we're both presenting an article and it's going to last an average of an hour it could be half an hour in each piece if not i mean personally i think maybe we could even just play it by ear and if we get really into one one topic and, and one article that the other person's presented we can save the other one for next week and uh, that's how we're going to do it basically so we're going to decide on a very subjective level and very subjective and biased level we're going to pick <laughs> one particular topic and one particular perhaps news news article or, or academic paper or whatever it is and we're going to just sit down and we're going to dis- discuss it with each other um and i look forward to doing it in in the future <laughs> yeah it sounds it nice and cozy doesn't it yeah 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 and um it should be fun so yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, that's us, us for tonight. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Cheers, for, Paul. For, Thanks for that. <laughs> well, thank you as well, Kieran. We'll hear from you soon. All right. Great start. Bye, everyone.